introduce you, and then you can do the history of oh, yeah, the okay. company with no, Deke, no, and then no, I'll take no, over no, on the no. design principles. Yeah. No. All right. Welcome back, okay. everybody. Day three of the Hi-Fi Summit. And right now we've got Michael Vamos from Audio Skies and John Larson from Larson Speakers. What is going on, everybody? Hey. Awesome. Good to be here. Hey. Hello. Glad Hello. you can make it, John. Glad to have you guys. All right, we're waiting for everybody to get in here. So the stream just started. Um, we're streaming on multiple platforms. So a few YouTube channels and a few uh, Facebook pages. I heard so we'll we're, on, to... we're in CBS as well, live. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to bring in the comments from all the sources. So yeah. um, you'll we'll try to bring up a bunch of stuff on the screen. But yeah, we're going to be talking about Larson speakers today. I'm excited. Because uh, I have some Larson 4s in that room. And a uh, very interesting design. And, you know, I've heard you talk a lot about it, Michael Vamos. And uh, it'll be interesting to hear what uh, Mr. Larson has to say. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're very okay. happy to be here. We're happy to, uh, you know, be in the Hi-Fi Summit again. And uh, to see you three guys. Uh, it's always good to see you. And... Uh, I'm very happy. I mean, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I'm uh, Michael Vamos. I am the uh, founder of Audio Skies. We're an uh, we're, uh, importer and distributor of high-end audio in North America. We do a lot of brands. We do gamut, amps, speakers, cables. We do Idion Audio, um, digital components, DAC streamers, uh, we do pair audio blue turntables, amplifiers. We do Levin design brushes. We do, I mean, uh, Neupod isolation devices. And of course, least but uh, last but not least, we do the great Larson speakers. And the cool thing I think about today is I think a lot of people would be interested is uh, we got John Larson here from Sweden. Uh, yeah. It's midnight over there and uh, he's up for us. And uh, he's worked. Uh, with this concept that's been around yeah. for a long, long time. And uh, John, if you can just introduce yourself maybe and then tell everybody the history, you know, of the Larson speakers from Steve Collins, you know, and all the way up till today. And uh, I think everybody would be interested in that. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm John Larson, uh, the owner and the founder of uh, Larson High. And this story started in uh, 1981. Uh, the company I worked at at that uh, time got uh, the license to produce uh, Carlson speakers. And uh, because I worked as a um, development engineer on the company, I, uh, it came to on, on my table, the first thing. And um, I uh, I took the chance to to meet my big idol. In fact, my first stereo in, in 1970 was a pair of his first uh, models, OA5. <laughs> um, but um, we I met Steve Carlson and uh, we came really good along, and. Uh, um, the first model we uh, started with was, was uh, OA51, and a few years later, uh, OA50 and 52 uh, came. And uh, uh, if we if we go further into, uh, uh, I must uh, I must uh, mention that uh, Steve Carlson died in '97. Uh, 71 years old in, in 97 and after that um, I st started to develop my own brand with, uh, with two guys helped me uh, Stefan Björklund and uh, Anders Eriksson and um, uh, the first thing we made was it was uh, 2005 I think it was we started to develop them and the uh, uh, and the model we do today is based uh, on uh, the old OA52. And uh, we have 
of course, we have uh, developed it further and uh, changed a lot in both the uh, frequency response and uh, uh, crossover units and so on. And we started uh, with the fours and the sixes. And two years later, uh, the two and a half way system, uh, Larsen 8, came. And uh, a little more than a year uh, since the last nine started to be uh, to be produced. So um, that's uh, in short terms what we how how we, the development has gone. And uh, I think that uh, Michael will explain a little more about the speakers. Well, also. John, he just forgot to mention. So basically, Steve Carlson, who was uh, the guy who made Carlson Acoustics, he actually made his first speaker in 1956, yeah. which was a speaker that hang, hung yeah. from the ceiling. And that was his first attempt as how to get a speaker to interact correctly with the, with the room. Mm. And then in the 60s and 70s, he made the Sonap speakers, which if there's any um, audio files that's been around for a while, everybody, they, they sold in tens of thousands in the US. Uh, he never was quite happy with the brand, so he ended up um, basically making his own brand, which is the Calls and Acoustics, where John joined him and they designed you know, the OA52, which is, or the Larson speakers are based on and that what they developed further on. So it's almost been what 70 years this development. And it's because basically Steve Carlson that he he built a house that had like dozens and dozens of microphones all over the room in order to find out how do I make a speaker that actually works in the room. And he spent years and years and years. So this is not like, oh, we just came up with this. You know, yesterday or a couple, a little while ago, it's been around for a long time, and and uh, uh, very happy to to represent the the brand. Did I get all that right, John? Almost, but you you did mention <laughs> uh, one of his one of his first models he made in uh, in the fifties was like a. Uh, like a big cone standing on the floor with a bash unit in the bottom and four tweeters sitting around in the top and a meter. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. It was in about a, a meter high. Yeah. Uh, it was called in here, Sweden, coal bottom. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. basically, so, so the, all of these years, you know, he tried to get it to work perfectly with the room and you know all these generations it's the first of very many sonap speakers where they were omnidirectional then the calls and acoustics all the earlier models then finally the oa52 which was the best and then now the larson so there are a lot of people other companies that have tried to get to this result in 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 you know in different ways but the Larson speakers is basically the only one that really succeeded. Um, the other ones were good at some things, like the Sonaps were good at some mm -hmm. things. The the calls and acoustics were great at other things. But the Larsons kind of got it all kind of to work really, really well. Um, I think uh, if I if I explain a little bit about how the Larson speakers work, will probably be um, be very helpful to the to the to the listeners. Um, Basically, the it's very simple. There's no hocus pocus about it. Um, if you if you if you take a laser pointer and you sit in your room and you put a mirror on the wall and you point it into the mirror, the beam is going to be reflected somewhere. The sound does exactly the same way. So, it comes out of the speaker and then it hits all the reflections and it goes all around. And if you have a conventional speaker, the way that the they're basically developed is they're all more or less developed in an anechoic chamber, which means just a chamber that has no reflections. Now, this is a great and an ideal world. The only problem is that everybody has actual walls in their living room. Like, 
I don't know anybody that doesn't have walls, which means that in theory, it's a perfect speaker, but it doesn't work the way it should in, in, in a room that has walls. So basically what you have to do is get the speakers away from the walls. You have to eliminate all the early reflexes, the ones from the back wall, the ones from the side walls, from the floors. Every early reflexes basically means, I think it's 0.02 uh, milliseconds. If the signal arrives to you, to your brain that fast after the direct signal from the speaker, the brain can't tell the difference between the direct sound and the reflective sound. So it will think it's a distortion. And what happens is it basically screws up your sound stage and you get the sort of the brain goes, wait a minute, this is not, I'm hearing sounds from two places at the same time. So, and it's not, I'm not knocking conventional speakers because we're a distributor and we distribute conventional speakers, but they do have to be set up properly you do have to have a room where you can accommodate it. Um, I think one of the great advantages of Larson speakers is a lot of people would have a sofa somewhere where that's where their sofa goes and they want to put the speakers in front of the, the sofa. Mm -hmm. Well, it won't work like that. You put the speakers where they need to go and then you need to move the sofa where the speakers are. That's if right. you do it the other way, you're basically not getting the potential out of the speakers that you could get. Um, and so basically what the what Steve calls and then what John Larson has has continued is that it's it basically how do we find out how to make a speaker that we can predict how it will work in any given room. And the only way you can do that is if you find out where's the first reflex coming from. And the only way you can find that out is you, okay, I'll put it against the wall. Now I know there's a reflection right behind me right away. Now, if I use the right drivers, the right make the right crossover, I reflect and absorb certain, you know, uh, early reflections, et cetera, et cetera, the angle of the drivers, if I do all that, I now have a speaker that has eliminated all the problems that a conventional speaker has. So it's very smart because if you, uh, yeah, we can actually see behind John. Um, there's a top of you a pair of Larson the, 9 the speakers. So basically, the yeah, so the drivers are angled like this, each of them, they're mirror images of each other. So they're angled upwards, slightly upwards and slightly inwards towards the listener. So that means there's no reflections from the side walls. They have subsorption material behind them and below them. So there's no reflections from the floor or the rear wall. And because the speaker is right there, and you, if you make the crossover correctly, you now have correct base because we know the wall is there. So it's not like, the base is six feet in front of it, and then it's reflected from the back wall afterwards. No, it will be the correct base every time. So all you have to do is put it against the wall and not have it in the corners. You have now eliminated all the early distorting reflexes. And because the, the drivers are angled slightly upwards and inwards, that also means that they travel the longest amount of time before they hit another surface. Now, the advantage of that is now you only have late reflections, but those are natural. Like, they're supposed to be there. They are there if you go to a concert hall. If you go to a concert, you get reflections from the ceiling and the side walls, et cetera, et cetera. And you want those because those are those that inform you what kind of instrument you're listening to, uh, to get the correct timbre of voices and instruments. Um, if you would go into a cave and you would yell, and there's no echo, the brain goes, wait a minute, there's supposed to be an echo here, something is wrong. So late reflections is natural and we need that. Um, so basically what happens when you have um, when you have the Larson speakers is you have eliminated the early reflexes, uh, distorting reflexes, and you have correct base at the same time. And because you are right against the wall, you can now get a lot deeper and tighter base um, 
from a relatively small cabinet. Um, I don't know if we can see it in my picture, but behind me, uh, yeah. So those are Larson's fours. They're only 30 inches high, but they play under 30 hertz uh, from a six and a half inch woofer. So that is really impressive for the size of the cabinet. And it's, it's tight, deep bass. It's not boomy. It's not... Um, uh, it doesn't sound unnatural or exaggerated. Um, so basically, um, I think why this design is so helpful is bes besides the fact that they sound really great, you know, even if you don't consider that you don't need to sound treat your room and you don't have to learn how to set up speakers and you don't have to arrange your living room totally because your speakers occupy a fourth of your living room, um, you now have uh, the ability to get the sound that you're supposed to get because if a customer buys a conventional speaker, which can there's a lot of them out there that are that are very good, um, if they're not set up correctly, um, you won't get the potential out of them. And and we see a lot of pictures from people that post to us on on Facebook and Instagram. You see this typical stereo rack, and then you see two large floor standing speakers on either side of the stereo rack right against the wall. And I don't have to go to listen to the to the system. I know that there's a problem with the bass in that system. I mean, because you can't, you need speakers, conventional speakers, they need to be away from the side walls. They need to be away from the back walls a certain distance. And there's usually only one position or two in a room where they can go. And you have to put them there and you have to know how to put them there and you have to learn to do that. Um, Joe, who is reviewing a pair of Larson 4s right now, we we talked about this, whereas um, when you set up conventional speakers, basically because you want to eliminate all the walls, you usually get a plus 3 dB um, bump up in the mid-range and in the treaty region. And it's basically because they are far from the walls. You are far from the walls. They're towed in at your ears. So you're getting, you know, bombarded directly with those very directional uh, sound waves from mid-range, upper mid-range tweeter um, that goes right at you. And so a lot of speakers, conventional speakers, they are slightly forward in the mid-range. And... A lot of people might be used to that, but if you would go to a concert and compare, there actually wouldn't be that very forward mid-range. Like it would be more balanced uh, from bass to tweeter, you know, through the frequency region. Um, and I think, I think that um, for a lot of people, unless you have very forgiving spouses and you are living in a room where you can have a dedicated setup where you're free to put them up wherever you want and where you can put reflections on the sidewall and on the back wall, et cetera. If you can't do that and you don't know how to set them up and all these other things, then you know, you're know you buying uh, something that is not nowhere near its potential. I always use the analogy of a Formula One car. You know, a Formula One car is probably the highest performing race car in the world. But, you know, let's, I used to live in Manhattan. Um, three blocks with potholes in Manhattan and that Formula One car would be toast, you know. So uh, the Larson speakers are more for the real world. They give you the same performance. They give you great sound, but they actually work without you having to try to work around the room. So they don't work against the room, but with the room. I don't know if all uh, I, it makes sense, but it's it's. Uh, I think it's a very smart design, and um, I think the 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 last review that was on the Larson Nine was was very point on. Um, kind of said, well, you haven't really heard anything like it anywhere in any other speakers, except for of course in real music, mm. and. I think it's a good analogy because if you listen to jazz music or classical concerts and you go listen to a pair of Larson speakers, 
it is very much that same, it tries to recreate that concert hall in your room. It, it, especially if you put on recordings that are, um, that are recorded live in a space, you know, mm -hmm. you get this sense of depth and, and, and height. Uh, we always play at, at, uh, at shows, we play this, um, this record. Um, what is it called, John, with the organ? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> Two people uh, that are blanking out. Uh, well, anyway, it's recorded. It's, it's recorded with two omni uh, omnidirectional microphones in a church in Sweden, and it's a organ with this huge Swedish choir. And it starts pretty quiet, and suddenly the whole <laughs> choir <laughs> comes in, and. If you close your eyes, it's like being in the church. You can hear how high, really high the scene, the stone, how huge it is, you know, the late resonances of, of the church. Uh, it's 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 really amazing when, when you listen to that, you can get transported. And I think that's what, you know, when we, I know that, we also distribute conventional speakers, but I think a lot of speaker manufacturers, and there's not to diss any other brands at all, but they don't talk that much about the room and how much the room affects the sound. And it really does. I mean, it's like saying that the road that you drive a car on doesn't matter whether it's gravel, racetrack, or normal potholes in the street. I mean, makes a huge difference to the performance of something. And um, so basically with a lot of conventional speakers, you are basically, you have to find the knowledge, you have to learn or have someone do it who knows to set them up. And if you can do that, then they are great speakers. There is no doubt about that. But the Larson speakers kind of solves all those problems in advance. So you don't have to learn, you don't have to buy sound treatment and you just put them up against the wall. Um, there was one review that wrote uh, that I was one of the happiest uh, distributors in North America, and he's like, he speculates. Well, it's probably because it only takes him 10 minutes to set up his speakers and everybody else has to spend five hours. Sure. <laughs> and it's so, it's kind of true, you know, we kind of, John and me, we go into a room like, okay, I think, what do you think about this distance? We sit down, all right, let's move the sofa, you know, a foot back. All right, we're good. All right, let's go to lunch. You know, it's it's kind of that easy. Um, and I think, you know, when you're buying something that's a high performance, uh, will be like, I don't know, buying a, a Ducati race bike and you try to do the suspension and the tire pressure yourself, but you have no idea what it should be for your weight or for your drive. So this way, I think um, it's much more hands-on. And there's one, uh, there was actually Joe who reminded me of this. Um, one of the very cool features that a lot of our customers like about the Larson speakers, which which I also personally prefer is, I love to listen to music with people, with other people, not just by myself. Sure. So with regular conventional speakers, you're a little bit locked like in this kind of like wearing headphones, headphone vice. Um, so if you're off to the side, you don't really hear uh, one channel. You might lose one channel. Um, so the Larson speakers, you don't have to sit optimal position, of course, always in the middle. But if you're off to the side, you can still hear both sound sides of both speakers. You still get great imaging. And the reason for that is if you're sitting right in front of the left speaker of a Larson pair of speakers, like that one over the, the left one over there, you were sitting in front of that, like six feet out, you would be closer in distance to that speaker than to the one on the right side. But because of the angle of the drivers, you would be now in the direct path of the right speaker. So the image kind of gets corrected for you by the speakers, regardless of where you are. So you can kind of sit anywhere you want. You can even move around. So you're not like you know, you go up and pour a glass of wine and you're like, hey, wait a minute, what happened in the right speaker there? I got to go back, rewind. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of real world advantages besides just great, great sound. Um, and, you know, if, if anybody has uh, um, 
you know, that are listening has any questions, you know, we're, I'm sure that Joe is going to, is looking at them and we're, we'll come to them and explain during um, anything. Yeah, I think specific. we lost John though. Huh? Yeah, it looks like we lost I think him. we lost him. Maybe his battery died on his phone. We lost John? Yeah, I don't know if it, his battery died on his phone or laptop. Maybe he went for a glass of wine. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. He heard you talking about wine. Um, you know, I heard uh, I heard a, uh, someone saying before that a uh, an audio file's life is very solitary. You know, you have the really nice, expensive speakers, one chair, you know. Um, so it's good to see, like, with these Larsons that – everyone can experience good sound no matter where they're sitting. It doesn't have to be right there smack dab in the, in the sweet spot. Yeah, I, I agree. And I also think one of the reasons maybe why it's solitary is because, well, let's say your friend next door has a hundred thousand dollar system, right? Every time you come visit, you're sitting off to the side, he's sitting in the center position. <laughs> Whoever one of them is always going to be unhappy. You know, one is like, "Wow, yeah. this sounds freaking great," and the other one is like, <laughs> eh, "Yeah, okay. right. I'll, I'll go to the bar. You know, you have fun." <laughs> so, it it it. Um, I mean, so I think, and also a lot of people that we talk to, you know, like um, you know, people that have like these uh, living rooms where the kitchen is in the back. Mm -hmm. So I heard from a lot of our customers that bought the speakers. You know, they're they're standing cooking and they're moving a little bit around, but it kind of fills the room. It's not like here. It's like at a concert hall. If you go to a good concert hall, you can sit in the center. You could sit to the left. You can sit to the right. You can sit in the back. There's great sound everywhere. You're not like, oh, I'm losing something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say when I was testing these out, the first thing I noticed was that the sweet spot, you know, the stereo image didn't break. You know, if I move left and right, whereas like, you know, some some good speakers can kind of do that. Yeah. Right. Once you start getting to extreme angles, that image is just going to completely break versus with these. You know, if you move to the right, it's just like it skews. Yeah. Right. Center image stays in the same place and it just kind of your angle of it kind of uh, skews. But um, yeah, that's, that was very interesting. Let's see here. What comments we have here. Well, I can also uh, tell you, I'll talk a little bit about the, the the differences. So if someone doesn't have um, just some tips for people out there that, that have conventional speakers, that they're not buying Larson speakers. So one thing that um, you, everybody should do if they have conventional speaker is you got to get rid of that first reflex in the wall. Basically, the mid-range will go off and it will hit the both sides of the walls and reflect back to your ears. You just need some soft material, you know, to cover the wall, maybe like three feet wide by six feet tall, hang it around the height of the middle and the height of the mid-range driver. Could be a curtain, you know, fabric, uh, canvas, anything, books, bookshelves. Um, that will make a big difference and, and a, a nice thick rug in front of the speakers also is really good to get rid of the reflex off the, the front floor. Um, this is a good question. Um, do you, what happens if you have a treated room and you use these speakers? Nothing bad happens. The only thing that you shouldn't do with any speakers that's regardless of brand is you'd never want to over dampen your rooms. There are two different kinds of sound treatment. Mm -hmm. One is you're getting rid of uh, reflections and one is you're trying to dampen, which means it basically sucking up sound waves. So there's some dealers out there. I don't know. Some of your customers probably have been. Um, if you go into a room, uh, this is a little uh, what I talked about earlier. If you go into a cave where there's no echo. Right. If you go into a dealer's room that is overly absorbent, like they have thick carpets, they have thick absorbers in all the corners, the ceilings, all the walls. It sounds dead. Mm -hmm. What happens with too much absorption, that is that all the dynamics gets trapped inside the absorption material and just gets transferred into heat. And it sounds dead. Now, the biggest difference between live music and playback music is dynamics. If I take my guitar right now and I just string the guitar softly, there's an enormous amount of dynamics. 
and too much dampening will kill the dynamics and then it won't sound alive it won't be exciting visceral it would be pretty and there might not be any bad sound but it ultimately will be boring um there's a few speaker manufacturers that put a lot of dampening materials inside their speakers and the same problem comes you you get a very good sound but there's no dynamics and i'm sure that both of you has heard places, you know, dealers or rooms at shows where it's just all sucked up. So you can have sound treatment. You just, if it sounds totally dead when you talk uh, unnaturally, then it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I uh, think it would be uh, good to, go ahead, China. Oh, I was just going to say, I was at some weird art installation when I lived in LA and it was so quiet. Like I could like hear my heart beating louder. Like it was just like, it was crazy. Like I almost felt like I could hear my blood flowing <laughs> inside yeah. me it was just really odd and you know um i've i've seen people that you know here in my music studio i have like two inch foam at the reflection um uh points the first reflections and i see people doing like four inch foam and stuff like that and i'm like i i think that's that's a little too much like there's a certain point like you can kind of go overboard with that yeah stuff. basically for for reflection like if you take a thick thick uh, towel and you fold it once that's kind of thick enough that's enough to take mm -hmm. reflection away we actually um we have we also distribute gamut speakers when we go to shows they have normal curtains which are pretty thick but then they also have these under hang under curtains you know that that block out light that are really thick black curtains Mm -hmm. So the designer, Benno, he actually goes up and rips all the, the curtains down because they suck up dynamics. And the gamut speakers are very dynamic, and he doesn't want to do that. So when we use the Larson speakers or gamut speakers, we do get rid of the first reflexes for the gamut speakers, but we actually never, ever use absorption material as such. No bass traps, all of that. The reason why most people put bass traps in is because either the speakers are too big for the room or the speakers are not set up correctly. If it's a well-made speaker and it's set up correctly, you don't need a bass trap. That nobody needs it. Either the room is too small, the speaker is too big, or they're not set up correctly. Um, There's a question here. What amps go well with the Larson besides Gamut? <laughs> yeah, we actually get that question a lot. And I think it's important uh, to talk about this. I'll just for a couple of minutes just to so uh, a lot of people ask about watts watts is a very you can't really say like how much power can the speakers take well the first thing that would depend on is the size of the room like if you use 100 watts in a 5 by 5 room that will play very loud if it's 100 watts in a 20 by 50 room it won't be that loud so that the the more the more the bigger the room is the more power the speaker will need in order to play really loud but another thing is also the kind of uh power that you have so it's more the quality of the amplifier and the quality of the power supply and the quality of the of the transformers and how much current it runs you can have a class d amplifier with a very small transformer with a uh, very low current that will list 400 watts but you can have a 50 amp quality tube amp that will outplay that 400 class D low current amp. So you can't put it like that. So as long as you have, I would go for a, a quality amp that has that has a good power supply and good um, uh, uh, a current. Um, we have used, I have a push pull 30 watts um tube app that easily runs the 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 larson speakers we also the pair audio blue um a hybrid amps they're 55 watts they easily run them so you don't need to have 200 watts you know uh it's more if you have a quality amp you're better served than trying to go for a huge amount of watts interesting question uh isaac asks if he uh can use these for home theater yeah Actually, John Larson, which we lost, uh, he has uh, it's a house with two floors. Um, 
he has uh, in the room where he watches TV, he have a pair of Larson sixes in the front, and then he puts a pair of Larson fours in the back. <laughs> the cool thing about the Larson speakers is all the models, including the, the small fours, which is the entry level, they all play under 30 hertz, so you don't need to buy a separate uh, subwoofer. And because they they give you this this great room information, like they don't, you know, just at the center spot that they kind of fill the room. That even with two speakers, you get phenomenal sound, like like you're at the movies. They also Larson speakers. They do make um, center and surround speakers that you can both put on the ground, hang on the walls, in four different ways for the various models. Um, but uh, the easiest way is two, and if not two, then put two small ones in the back so you get the, the rear sound, and then, of course, you can go for a center as well. A lot of these guys are saying, no, no, we always need a sub. They want that sub 20 hertz. <laughs> yeah, well, the one thing... <laughs> for, especially for home theater, right? Yeah, the one thing you have to remember when you're doing a sub is that it's, it's, it's a little like, uh, let's say you wanted to buy amp. A speaker uh, and you were going to use two different kinds of amps now that means that the bass would play sound from an from an amplifier that is a totally different design and sound from the mid-range and tweeter and I don't have to explain but that would sound strange you would get a certain kind of sound that might be very dynamic and fast in the bass and then you'd get a very warm and rich maybe in the mid-range upper and when you when you do uh, a subwoofer it's very hard to integrate it correctly to get great bass so you can get deep bass but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's great so it's important that it's it's it has the same as much sound characteristics as close to the, to the speaker that you're using i think and then to integrate it so that it has sort of sounds natural because if I'm, for example, listening to a pair of speakers that have great sound, and then I distinctly hear that all the deep sounds has a different character and comes from a different location, yeah, I'm getting deep bass, but I'm not really happy with it because that sounds like there's two bass players playing the same melody at different locations on a stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely have to integrate it and and uh, you know balance, balance it, it out. Yeah. Yeah. All I'm saying is it's not as easy as let me just go buy one and plug buy it in and now I'm Yeah, no, face. totally. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But um you're saying that the Larson fours have a six and a half inch driver? Yeah. And they play down to thirty hertz? Twenty eight. Twenty eight. That's 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 pretty remarkable. Yeah, so so one of the things that they do is right, you first of course you have the Larson's Speakers actually use really, really good drivers. It's it's very high quality scan speak uh, uh, drivers. The yeah, the Larson the Larson scan speak uh, tweeter and what a a say us, uh, Wolf right? Yeah, the Larson it? the Larson six, which is only four thousand dollars, uses the same drivers as uh, as Wilson and Sonus Faber, but they are fifteen thousand dollars. So it's the only speaker that I know under ten thousand that uses such good drivers. But the point is, if you get a good driver that already can make good sound, what you can do if you make the crossover, it's pretty complicated in the Larson speakers, is that because you have the wall right there, you know you're getting a certain between plus three and plus six dB bump in the bass. Now you can do the crossover and tune the driver to actually create a deeper bass from a smaller cabinet. If I was going to place the same driver in the same enclosure, but in a conventional speaker six foot off the ground of the wall, my my response would now be, okay, now yeah, I'm playing right. maybe 36 hertz. And if you put it close to the wall, the front wall, then people will think, well, why don't I just take my front firing speaker and put it against the wall? Well, because now it will become very boomy, bad bass. So the smart thing about the Larson speakers is that the bass is correct. You don't have to figure out, okay, one inch forward, no, one foot more forward. You know, yeah, it's, just it's slap there. them up well, against the wall. That's these it. have to be uh, against the wall, though. That's what I noticed also. Is like if you pull them away and you try to do what you do with a normal speaker, then the bass really 
right uh goes yeah, down yeah. because they're designed to be near a wall if you move them more than three inches against the wall then you start losing more and more deep base the further you pull them away but it also defeats it's kind of the- interesting because it's it's interesting because it was designed to be near a wall and if you if you pull them away then it messes up the base whereas i think conventional speakers are meant to be pulled away from the wall but a lot of people put them against the wall yeah right well, we, we talk to a lot of dealers and what happens is, so let's say a customer comes out with his wife. The husband goes, I want to get these speakers. Like we had a guy who wanted to buy the, our, one of our dealers was a Kef dealer and, and the Larson dealer. So the, the husband wants to buy the Kef blades, uh, 32,000. He, the, he like, liked tall, the sound. Like, tall, skinny ones, right? Yeah, the, the ones that had the woofers on the side. Mm. that are like a little bit of like an obelisk um right so the the guy the husband likes the sound and the wife so he takes them home and the wife goes yeah that's nice up in the corner now the customer puts them in the corner where the wife wants them and the the customer calls the dealer this sounds horrible well they're in the corner okay so you can take them a little but there's a for away from the corner the wife says but they're still against the wall the customer says, they still sound horrible. Well, where are they placed? And he sends a picture. Well, did you notice where we had them in our room? You need them way, way further away from the side and the back wall. So, well, my wife won't let me do that. So the guy comes back. He sits down and listens to the Larson 8 speakers. He's like, yep, they sound great. I'll take those. The wife is happy. He's happy. So th- the Kev speaker is a good speaker, but it needs to be placed correctly, same as we distribute gamma speakers. You can't stick them against the, the sidewall or in the corner or the back wall. It, it won't sound good. It, it just won't. I think, I think it's important to talk about uh, how your how the angle of the speaker is reflecting off sidewalls because I think some people are kind of confusing that with like, you know, kind of like a direct reflect type of deal where you're just firing off speakers all over the place. Yeah, so, so the Larson speakers the is... There is not an omnidirectional speaker. Uh, with an omnidirectional speaker, you do certain good things, but you can't get a real clear image uh, soundstage for you because the sound is bouncing in all kinds of directions. So it's not an omnidirectional. What it is, it's I think it's 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 sloped thirty degrees or twenty eight degrees um, upwards and slightly less uh, inwards. So basically when you're listening, you're having them play where you're sitting. The If they were, you know, if you would take a laser pointer from the drivers and point straight up, it would hit somewhere above your head in front of you, slightly above and slightly ahead of you. And because they're angled inwards, not f- forwards, then there's no side reflection because normally it would be faced like this so you would get a reflection off the side wall. But because they're angled, it, it automatically eliminates the side reflections. And because it's, it's angled inward, there now would be a reflex from the rear wall, but it has absorption material here, right on the inside. It's built into the speakers um, so that reflex is killed by that absorption material. So now you have no rear reflection from the wall where they're against, and you don't have a side reflection. There's also absorption material beneath the, the driver, so you don't have the, the early distorting reflex from the floor either. The floor. So now you eliminated the three early distorting reflexes just by placement, angle, and absorption material. So what would be the difference between that and let's say if I have some, you know, I have these bookshelf speakers back here and if I really tow them in a lot, right, almost where they're crossing in front of you just to avoid the the side reflections, right? What would be, let's say if I did that and I had some uh, absorption material like right behind the the speaker, is that much different? Well, if you can't tow them in too, if you if you tow them in too much, so that let's say you take a pair of bookshelves, so they're towing in where it hits in front of you, then the image misses you. Then they're going to sound horrible. Like they have to be pointed at you. 
you can't point them inward so you can't tilt them in too much in which case inherently you're just you're still going to have those those reflections on yeah the side. and and the second thing is you then have to but that's what i said you you can get great sound from a conventional speaker but the the first problem like the way you set up a conventional speaker is you first have to set them up for the correct bass you don't even listen to the mid-range or tweeter at all so we usually measure the rooms when we're setting up conventional speakers and we go by prime numbers and it's measured from the front of the cabinet and there's only one position where they're going to sound the best and it's usually uh, a fifth or a third off the back wall or a fifth or a third off the side wall which means we're talking you know six to eight feet into the room either way depending on the size of the room um in a regular room and that's what you have to do so if you have your your bookshelf speakers they're going to have the same problem if your bookshelf is against the wall there is going to be you know boom reflex off the back wall even from a bookshelf speaker you still will have to even if you cross them over you would still have to put um material behind the speakers and not just i don't mean but you would have to put it for a wide area because the bass all the low notes go out like this so you have to basically get rid of the whole back wall for for bass so you can do it and that is the best thing you would do if if you had a bookshelf just tow them in towards you but uh, unless you're very far from the side walls you know hang a curtain hang a painting uh put a bookshelf above some books you know always the first reflex is 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 if you sit down and you have glass on either side and you listen if you suddenly put a thick curtain over where those reflexes are your suddenly your sound stage goes Whoop! the center the center image will be perfect the sound stage will be huge you remove it it gets a little chaotic you can't really the instruments get a little skewed and so forth so I would always try to get first rid of the first reflex instead of over towing in. All right. Now, a lot of people, obviously, the look of those, um, you know, they always say, hey, you know, I've seen those Ohm Walsh's. They look kind of the same. I think you may want to address what's yeah. different. Yeah, they, the fours are the only ones. The, the bigger models doesn't look like that. But these look a little. Um, but it's totally different speaker. Um and if you would lift the hood off an ohm wall speaker, you could see it's totally different. So where we actually have a specific driver away, like a mid-range woofer driver and a tweeter pointing in towards the listener like this, the ohm wall is omnidirectional. So it's a it's a it's a woofer mm -hmm. mid-range driver that's hanging upside down and it can't be against the wall. It radiates in all in all directions now some of them have tweeters that are angled in towards you but the mid-range and the woofer goes omnidirectional and that means that you you don't have a sound stage i don't think you have a clear image because you it gets thrown everywhere and it gets basically it gets thrown right against the rear wall yeah see here the middle one if you look at the middle that's the angle of the the speakers so slightly inward slightly upwards towards you so that would be the right speaker and the left speaker would be a mirror image that would also be uh in towards you um the, the other thing that's interesting about this is it looks like it's an op open baffle but that woofer actually has is enclosed right is it behind that yeah there's like a enclosure behind it yeah there. yeah it is closed behind yes and it's the larson speakers are ported actually yeah and the cool thing is you're like, where are, they port? Port. where are they ported? <laughs> right here. It's actually an upward fire port, port inside. Um, um, but just to finish with the with the difference between the ohm walls, so even though they look the same, the ohm walls is a totally different design. It's an omnidirectional speaker, um, and it will not have... Uh, I'm not saying that they're anything about how they sound or whether they're bad or good, but they will not have correct bass by you you have to figure out where the bass is correct same as a as a front firing and you still have to fix all the things with the early reflections that is not fixed in the own walls at all you have to 
take care of that. Hey, we have John back. back. Where he's back. Hello. Yeah, where did you go, yeah. John? I don't know I told, what happened. I told him you went to drink, <laughs> but I don't know if I was wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> what did you? Yeah. Okay. I I have a question for you, John. Yeah. So uh, I've heard I've heard Michael Vamos talk a few times about how there's a a bump in the mid range with t uh, conventional speakers. Um, I'm not understanding that fully and how you guys compensate for that with the Larson speakers. Because we don't get any reflexes from the wall. That's quite easy. Because of you oh. cannot control the, the reflexes. When you have normal speakers in a room, you get uh, reflexes uh, mostly from the back wall. And uh, if you don't... Uh, what should I say? Vary the the distance to the back wall. Then you can have different uh, sound in the mid range. But we always have the same sound. We can tr we can control it. That's why. Well, and and also, um, like I said, with a with a regular conventional speaker, you are sitting closer to the speakers they are towed in right at your ears. So the reason why they have a slight bump up in the mid-range, meaning more energy than is actually in the recording, like it's slightly louder in the mid-range, is because you're very close to the driver and it's pointing straight at your ear. The Larson speakers are not, you know, they are filling into the room. So they're not like right in your ears. It's a little, it's a little bit between sitting uh, in a cafe in, and listening to a trumpet player or pulling your chair right in front of the, the trumpet player and having him play into your head. You know, uh, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it's a little bit like that. So, yeah, but, yeah, but, uh, but that's why you, you, you don't control it as we do. I mean, the, the, uh, speakers are always in the same position and that's what uh, mr green uh, mentioned in his uh, review the reflect free zone that he he means that the, the speakers are always placed against the wall and they will all always have the same re, uh, frequency response it don't vary us because of when you have uh, normal speakers you can place them wherever you want in the room and not you are not quite sure what uh, the result would be yeah that was I, steve, uh, steve Carlson was after <laughs> he would have speakers for normal listening room yeah he was actually uh he was slightly more um arrogant when he said these things he basically said i think one of his quotes is my speakers are the only speakers in the world that actually sound yes. natural in a normal room. <laughs> exactly. So was, that we yeah. used in the, in the brushes. <laughs> yeah. My speakers is, is the only speakers made for usual uh, living rooms or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's actually something that I read in um, one of his papers from before was that there's something that happens with the mid-range um, that causes that. Uh, plus 3 dB bump, and I just, I really uh, didn't understand that. Well, it's basically if you you have, let's say this is the recording and has this much energy yeah. normally, right? Because yeah. the because a, on a conventional speaker, because you, it's towed in directly pointing at your ear, and because you are close to it, because you have to be, because you got to be. Why, why only those frequencies? Why not the other frequencies? No, because uh, a bass, uh, so well, I'll talk briefly about this first so I can explain the other thing. So basically when you have uh, um, uh, any kind of sound, when you go in the really deep, uh, like 20 hertz, it radiates in a circle. And as you go up in frequency, the, the radiation becomes more and more no directional. And when you get to really, really high, it, it oh. goes straight forward. It doesn't spread out at all. And so what happens is oh. if you have a conventional speaker is that you have a woofer 
that that radiates in all directions, even behind it. That's why you get it's, bad base, and that's why you have omnidirectional. To... Yeah, yeah, it, it radiates in all directions. In 360 degrees, it yeah, radiates. Yeah. Uh, Mr. So, Green uh, mentioned that in his review, too, uh, about this. Uh, because normal speakers in the bottom up to four or five hundred hertz, perhaps, it would be uh, omnidirectional. Yeah. But when you came up in the frequency, it would be more directly firing. But with the last speakers, you have the same pattern all down from the bass and the whole way up. It's a half yeah. wave uh, distribution, you could say. Yeah. That's a difference. So, That's a difference. So yeah, so basically, instead of when a conventional speaker, which has drivers, the woofer would go in 360 degrees, the mid-range would go maybe 180 or slightly less, and the tweeter would go very directional. The speaker now fires exactly. energy in three different ways, and as a listener, you can hear that, wait a minute, this is like there's all these different energies coming towards me that does it in a different way. Um, so when you remove, that's why you have to get the speaker away from the wall so that you are towed in a conventional speaker. And that's why it basically, it forces the speaker to, to point straight at your ears. So because you are closer and because it's pointed straight at your ear, it actually makes the natural energy of the recording, which is this much, to be this much. Because you are closer and right in its path. But with the Larson speakers that are against the wall, they the the three the the all the frequencies they will all radiate the same way and hit you the same way, so you get this uniform um, frequency response, you know, from the bottom all the way up to the tweeters. Here's a question that did, did uh, that makes sense, or did I explain that and John no. horribly? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did, I'm not here's sure if a you question. can read that. Yeah, um, John, so here's a question. I mean, with with this design, was yeah. there a consideration taken uh, for time alignment between the drivers to prevent a cancellation? Once more, I didn't uh, follow you. Sure. Uh, Matt asks, with this design, was there a consideration taken for, for time alignment between the drivers to prevent cancellation? Cancellation of what? Yeah. yeah, maybe you want to clarify the question. What else? Yeah, at, I'll wait for you to, to clarify your question. Okay. Uh, but did that explanation from me and John, did that make sense or was it muddled? Yeah, I just wanted to hear John say it because he sounds so cool. Yeah, <laughs> we can let John talk. <laughs> yeah, before you, I don't want to lose him again. Yeah, but, I, I, I'm not, but, but I'm not quite sure what you mean in, in your question. That's that's why. Uh, so he, he said uh, cre but I, um, I can't. creating a null at the crossover point. So did you, um, where's the original one? Was there any consideration taken for time alignment between the drivers to present uh, to prevent a cancellation at the crossover point? How about this? Let me let me ask a cancellation at the crossover point. Yeah, he's like, well, why would we do that? Uh, so here's a question: What would, would the frequency a cancellation? How I think maybe he means um, how they how we face it. I'm I'm guessing just on what he means. Uh, maybe he's asking about how we face align the drivers, like going from the mid range to the tweeter. But that's kind of a crossover uh, question, which is how we keep the 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 crossover, meaning from from one driver to the tweeter. How, to make it seamless so you can't hear that there is a, 
that it, that the sound goes to another driver. I'm assuming that's what he's asking about, um, but I'm not sure. Uh, okay, uh, I I I really don't know how to answer that because of we <laughs> we just make the co crossover unit so you get a smooth. Um, uh, you go you go smooth from one unit to another that's the whole point and everybody do that i think <laughs> or they wish yeah. to do that uh, so here's a qu here's a question um would you say the the frequency response are you still trying to uh, aim for a flat frequency response even though they are uh pointed different directions and the design of it is different i assume the base of course you're accounting for it being close to the wall, but how about uh, the rest of the frequencies? Yeah, I, 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 no, I, I think I understand what you mean because of they are not um, they are not sitting in the same plane plane as uh, usual because they are working in thirty degrees. You could speak, as you could say, and uh, uh, but we consider we consider that, and uh, when we measure. We measure um, we measure the speakers uh, close to the wall. We measure them as they are used. That uh, other uh, producers don't do; they just measure it. But we use we measure them when it's close to the wall, and uh, it helps us because when it it is uh, placed in another room, it would still be the same. Yeah, and, and you also you measure at the listening position of where the where you're sitting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the only thing to do with this kind of speakers. You cannot measure them in in some other ways. It is possible. Yeah, normally you measure at one meter, one meter height, one meter distance from the speaker. But that becomes a you can only use that for development. It's a meaningless uh, measurement once you're actually listening to the speakers because yeah, of course. It, it's yeah. a measurement for just the speaker's performance without any room at all. So, so yeah, exactly. I would say, but and, uh, but aren't speakers uh, aren't rooms different? So, if you listen, if you measure the listening position, wouldn't that be um, vary more from room to room? How do you account for that? Yeah, but the the thing about the the yeah. Larson speaker, do you want to do it, John? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can just explain that uh, Steve Carlson had three different rooms that was in different sizes. He had one big room and one smaller and a little room. And he measured in all uh, those different rooms. And he, of course, it would differ, but it was so little that it was, uh, you could I I ignore it. It was, uh, it was nearly exactly the same. Yeah, but uh, then we are talking about the uh, the total uh, frequency curve we make. It's not uh, those funny thing they make in on other speaks uh, directly measured and so on. So uh, we we uh, we measure in a, in a special way. He <laughs> he made his own measurements, the Carlson, and we may uh, and we measure still the same way. I'm assuming it's uh, within some uh, listening window, right? Uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, you um, uh, you take the whole frequency response with reflexes and the whole thing. And of course, it can differ from room to room, but it it it, it don't affect the, the the sound from the speakers very much. It's almost the same. Yeah, it's it's if a little. It's a little like coming back to what I said in the beginning, which is how do you predict how a speaker will it work in a room? And if you have a conventional front firing speakers, there's no prediction because you have no idea how big the room is going to be. So you don't know how it's going to sound. But if you put it against the wall and you know the wall is there and you design it to be against the wall, then even though it's not perfect, it's the closest thing to being able to predict what it would work sound like in any normal given room. So we're not like there is a small difference, but the the response will be 
more or less the same in all rooms because we know we're right against the wall. So we're basically predicting how it's going to sound. And that's why it. we always say it works with the room, not against it. Okay, so I think what the question earlier was about is how the, the speaker is tilted back slightly. And so um, about time alignment, mm -hmm. right? Between uh, the mid mid woofer and the tweeter because it's tilted back like that. Yep. How is that accounted for? Yeah, John, you you take that one because that's a I, crossover it, measurement. Uh, I question. guess you have to understand that this is a very yeah. different design. Yep. And so people have a lot of questions like, why, yeah, why yeah. aren't all speakers designed like this? Like, yeah. how do you account for uh, that? So, you. yeah. But uh, that uh, we are after uh, all the re reflexes that we get in the recording room. If you listen in a concert hall, you will get a lot of reflexes. And uh, that was what Stig was trying to to um, to get the same uh, pattern. So you get a lot of reflections in the room. That's why the the um, the units are placed in an angle and inwards. So it's it spread the sound in the room. Yeah, so they, they basically, they are measuring for the fact that it's compensated for the 30 degree angle that they are. So when they're measuring, they're measuring so that it has that response, you know, correct response for the, for the face alignment um, at that angle. So it's not like they're just ignoring it. It's it's like, yeah, this is the angle that they are, and that's what we are measuring them after, and that's what we're going to do for. Yeah, it's all very but it, I think it's 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 quite easy because of if if uh, if you measure on units, they are uh, uh, on a, a normal speaker, you will measure them in, in one way and you will get a result. But if you tilt them, and there are many speakers that are tilted backwards, for instance, and uh, some other things, but you will you will get different results when you have a flat placement and you have it tilted in the with the same uh, with the same uh, crossover unit. But so you have to. Um, to consider that and the change in the in the in the crossover, so you you will get a flat uh, response even that you tilt them, because yeah. of you you also have to consider the, the angle when you look into the papers and you look at the frequency response in uh, for instance in a on a tweeter in a angle zero you have one frequency response. In 30 degrees, you have another one. It fell. It, it, it is falling down more, much earlier. So that you have to consider when you use you uh, uh, choose the uh, units and uh, find that kind of unit so they have a flat or nearly a flat uh, response in 30 degrees, and that's not easy. And All right, uh, we're gonna have to wrap up pretty soon because we're past an hour. And I would like for you guys to hang out in the VIP area and answer some questions there so we can kind of continue this conversation. Let's go ahead and answer just one last question here from, from Mark. He asked, so how would the sound change depending on the ceiling height? Do you want to take that, John, or you want me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can explain in, uh, in it in that way. If you have a room with a two meters height to the ceiling, and you have another room with three meters height, then you will get a lower uh, sound stage on the on the lower height and the, a bigger sound stage with a, a higher height because of uh, the spreading and the reflexes and so on. All right. Yeah, so Chana, you want to wrap this up? I know you got to... Uh, start setting up but you guys uh my michael and john hang out i'm gonna send a link here and you can uh, join us in the vip chat and answer it's some a, more of these a, questions it's a different link yeah it's a yeah i'll link. send you another uh, link so just stick uh, around after this when i okay, stop john, they're gonna send us a different link link on log on to that one 
Yeah, don't hit Leaf Studio just okay. yet. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you guys so much. Day three of the Hi-Fi Summit. Almost finished. We've got uh, the after party starting in about an hour. It is 80s night, so I will be playing a bunch of 80s tracks, of course. What kind of um, what kind of 80s music are you playing? Oh man, I, you know I don't. I got anything on title. I can play anything on title. So can I make me? a wish for an 80s track? Yeah, sure. Gotta give it up by Talk Talk. Talk Talk. Gotta give it up. All right. As long as it's on title, I can play it. It so, is. Uh, all right. Cool. I gotta write this down. Talk Talk. Uh, all right. So, um. So yeah. So uh, we'll see you guys in the video chat, the VIP video chat. Again, if you want access to the VIP video chat, go to the HiFiSummit.com. Click the Join Us button. Buy your ticket for instant access, and we'll see you guys in about an hour. Peace. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Hold on, John, and 